doctor, look. Stand aside, nurse. I'm Dr. Homebrew. Hey, what's up, everybody? Here we are again, Dr. Homebrew. We're back in the studio, in the virtual studio, of course, on Zoom. And uh, we're drinking beer, beer that is not brewed by us. And uh, it's not commercial beer, which I appreciate. You know, it's uh, it's it's few and far between, I guess. Then we're actually, you know what? I, people, that's a correction. I stand corrected. We have been getting a much more homebrew. People are sending us beer lately, and I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, it's been good. It's been it's been nice to sort of get back in. The, it's like we took a vacation. <laughs> yeah. You know, hit the hit the hit the um, community bar. You know, hit the resort mm-hmm. bar for a bit and drank some commercial beers and ran through those. And now we're back. You know, we're back home dealing with our our lovely lives. We have Colin back on the show. Colin sent a cold IPA. So we're going to be chatting about his beer and tasting that and going through that. And then in the second segment, we're going to be talking about what even a cold IPA actually is, how to make it, how to make it the right way, what it isn't also and what not to do, and then call it a cold IPA because there are subtleties to it. And I can't pretend that I know exactly what's going on with him, but uh, it's a new style. We're all learning here together. So if you're interested in cold IPA, this is the show for you. Colin might be the only person on here who's brewed one. <laughs> Probably, I would bet. I mean, unless Brian Shar is uh, keeping secrets. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just brewing every, I've been brewing like every other day for like the past six years. I just don't tell you guys. Uh. Yeah, you're I got I got like you know gallons and gallons and gallons of beers out in my garage. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's fantastic. So I keep my girlish figure. That's right. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsor, Five Star Chemicals. You go to fivestarchemicals.com today and learn the best way to clean and sanitize your home brewing equipment. While you're there, check out the Five Star Homebrew Club and go there, hit the link, join it. It's free, absolutely free, of course. And they send you tips and tricks. They let you try free stuff. Maybe even you get some free merch. Who knows what's going on? But you learn a little bit each time they mail you. And they don't email you, you know, like a whole lot. They don't spam you. Like some of these companies, man, I can't, I can't understand. I don't understand. I can't stand it. When people, they'll they'll do like three or four emails a week these advertising emails. And it's like, what are you doing to me? Who, who sits there and generates this content and thinks it's okay just to spam constant messaging, constant messaging. Yeah. It's uh, too much. It's, it's way like too when you, much. When you buy something and you buy it from a new place and you buy one thing, mm-hmm. you're like, okay, yeah, send me an email now and then with like a, a sale or something. Yeah. And you get like one or two a day. It's like, impossible, no, dude. No, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want that. I or you don't even sign up for it. One time. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. even tell you. And then you just suddenly you're like, oh, here's this, this, you know, 40% off this thing that you already uh, bought. Uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I bought an egg beater and now it's like showing me the next <laughs> level <laughs> egg beater that like will whip your eggs even a little faster. And it's, it costs yeah. $10 more but oh and then there's the super deluxe egg beater yep. and like i've got an egg beater dude yeah, <laughs> yeah it's called okay. a fork it's or like, like even a even worse is like you go to some other city and like you go to a restaurant and you put your credit card to like the square or whatever and then you start getting emails like four months later like twice a week from some restaurant you went to once in a place you drove through, you know, 400 <laughs> miles away. Like, no, even if you liked it, like, I'm not, I'm not going to go back. Yeah. I, I'm going to forget that you're there. I'm, I'm not going to drive 400 miles to go eat at your place, dude. It's weird, man. Yeah. It's weird. But uh, not- what, who won't do that is five star. Five star will yeah. not do that to you. And, you know, you join the club. Your, your information is sacred, sacred to them. And neither will Dr. Homebrew. We won't spam you either. Like, hey, want to buy some homebrew? Oh, wait, I can't sell you homebrew. Yeah. I, I make Go no make guarantees that I won't spam you. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll probably, I probably won't. We won't spam you. Um, although I do have like a bunch of shows to release. I, I somehow got behind on releasing shows. And I have one I'm going to release tomorrow. And then I think then that's it. And then we have these two that we're going to mm-hmm. do tonight. So I'm a little, a little behind, but I don't care anymore i realize i need a vacation everybody i need a break yeah. from from thinking about content for the last i don't know 20 years go constantly to com- uh, the commercial beer bar you were talking about uh, yeah. you know where you should go for a vacation then is disneyland 
no. I'm not going anywhere, dude. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Trying to end up in the hospital? Hell no, dude. Absolutely not. But anyway, Colin, what's up, man? Welcome back, dude. Thanks for having me. Glad cold, I, cold IPA. What is, uh, what's, your, what's your deal with that? Is that something you've done uh, before? Are you jumping on the hype train? Are you a hype man brewer? So I'm a lager brewer. I like brewing lagers there and I go. like hops. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Okay. Interesting. All and right. Gives me an excuse to brew with rice in a way that's uh, craft beer acceptable now. So. Okay. Hmm. I made the uh, cold IPA extra cold. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, wow. There's yeah, a story. There's a little story. The, uh, he's got it in the, well, explain what you're doing. You just show the camera. I, I put it in an ice bath. Uh, there's there a go. story, but because I, I accidentally gave you guys too many bottles and I thought I had another bottle, but then I only had the one that I judged last night. And sadly, I left it sitting out. And so it's not going to be, it's not going to be great. Or I might get an essence of what it was, but I judged it late last night. And now I'm going to be judging the dregs of what was left that have blown off all the carbonation on my counter last night. But it will be cold. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, right. it, was a, it was a weird-ass beer distribution prior to this show. Not that the listeners really care about all the details. Suffice it to say, there was a lot of weirdness. And uh, the important thing is we all got at least one bottle of every beer for tonight's show. There you go. All right, Char. Well, since we're letting Cooper's beer kind of chill out a little bit, <laughs> why don't you start off and we'll, uh, we'll get into Colin's beer. All right. That sounds good. Colin, thanks for sharing your beer. You know, I would ask you the question I usually ask at the beginning of every episode, but you've been on like a number of times and we all know if you're in a club, what club it is. And if the listeners really care, I encourage them to go back in the archives, uh, you know, the brewing network.com uh, just click on Dr. Homebrew uh, and just go back and re-listen to some of those classic old recent episodes that have you to get the full information about you and, and, and what you're about. You know, I'm going to, what I will start off though, the hell's wrong with you? you know, Coop, <laughs> what the I don't hell's think we wrong have time to list that out right Jesus now, Christ. Jason. I, right. <laughs> uh, we, we, there, there's not, we can do a whole separate show like Jay-Z's Medical Corner about like Better, you know, Brian's, meta, Brian's Mental Health Corner. I don't know. Betterhelp.com. Uh, exactly. <laughs> they, do they, every other podcast has ads for them. I wonder, wonder if we do. Uh, I don't know. So hmm. before the show, Coop and I were kind of, we were texting about, well, what should we judge this? This cold IPA as because there is no BJCP style for cold IPA at the moment. It's more of a, a commercial thing. Uh, and even looking at the Brewers Association, you know, BJCP guidelines, there isn't a separate cold IPA, which I, I find kind of interesting because usually the BA is usually on top of that. And someone someone hints at a new style and they'll have three versions of it uh, in the, the Brewers Association uh, guidelines. But uh I had suggested to, to Coop, oh, let's just, we'll judge this as a specialty IPA. And he whipped out something I had never heard of before, uh, which is- Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was, uh, uh, the BJCP has a, uh, let me go back here. There's a page, and I have it on my phone. I don't have it on, on my computer, uh, where if it will help you decide what category to put stuff in. The page is called bjcp.org forward slash style dash entry slash dash suggestions forward slash. And that will get you there. So, or just search style entry suggestions, BJCP, and you'll come to this page. Yeah, I think Um, that's, which I think is, uh, is great. And I'll tell you what, I, I love the BJCP. I've been in the BJCP for 20 plus years. Uh, you know, I'm not one to, I'm not saying anything bad about the BJCP here. Just sometimes the website can be a little hard to navigate and a little hard to figure out, find out things you want to find out. Uh, and it wasn't until I was today years old as a grandmaster one judge that I knew there was such a page. So that's, you know, for listeners out there, this is really interesting. Uh, it lists out a bunch of things that are not quite styles yet, but that people like to enter in competition, including, you know, uh, uh, Hoppy Weizenbach. I never heard about that one. Uh, session IPA, different kinds of IPA. Uh, pastry, pastry stout. Stouts, yeah. <laughs> uh, Belgian stouts in Mexican lager. Hey, this is an important thing for maybe the next uh, a, a few shows from now. Hint, hint. Uh, 2A International Pale Lager, specify Mexican lager. Okay. Now, if uh, you're wondering so, where to put that stick of alt beer, you can figure out where to put it. You and I've stick never, it. 
right? Yeah, right just, <laughs> 27. Stick it in 27. Uh, I've never heard of a coit, a K-O-Y-T. That's a new one on me, but hmm. I need to go up. Uh, if I do a Google search for that, the first thing that comes up is 97.1 KOYT, low power FM community radio for Anza, <laughs> California. Uh, so it, the listeners should now be grateful that I went to law school and not radio school. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine having lived uh, the WKRP lifestyle, a Dutch style, quite, quite, or quite style of beer, uh, popular in the Netherlands from 1400 to 1550. So I, I don't know who got in there, uh, went through the Guardian of Forever or something and went back and figured out the details uh, of what that thing uh, tasted like. But uh, th thanks to them. Anyway, yeah, lis listeners, when you're sending us beer or you're entering it in competition, that's uh, that's a great page. And I'm really glad, you know, Coop, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out to me. I never knew that existed. You're welcome. And, and that's something that, you know, us and the listeners can all utilize when we're brewing some you know, oddball type styles that don't have their own own thing in the in the guidelines. Uh, if so ever brew, brew a, a Florida Vice or a Gruit or a Japanese yeah. rice lager, now you'll know what. To have do. we not? Have we not talked about Collins beer yet? No, no. Well, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, you can just tune out for a while. We're gonna jabber on about this page for about ten more Good. minutes. And, right. You know, Florida Florida Vice is kind of like that Katarina sour. But uh, <laughs> let's get into Collins beer, huh, guys? It's, it's an audio medium and not a visual medium, but Collins let's got his the, head, forehead in his head. Let's right get now. into Collins beer, <laughs> huh, guys? All right. The, the, All right. the long and short of it is this is a 34B. Collins beer yeah. is yep. a cold IPA. It's to be judged as a 34B, which is a mixed uh, style mixed beer. Style let's beer. get into yes. Collins beer, huh, guys? It's like IPA <laughs> and American lager crossed, <laughs> yeah. kind of. This exactly. is Brian Shar's time. Brian has the floor. I'm, I'm waiting for Brian to get okay. into Collins beer, huh? Okay. okay. So ar aroma. Uh, but first off, bottle inspection. It's a bottle. Uh, I checked that box. Appropriate size, cap, fill level, label removal. Uh, good job on that. Uh, aroma. Initially, uh, I, I got kind of a malty but also kind of a cellar-like aroma. Uh, I have cellar-y, like cellar-y. Uh, mm. <laughs> that's pun not intended. Uh, a little bit like a beer de garde, which I thought was weird because I could hardly think of two things more unlike one another than a cold IPA and a beer de garde. They're yeah, both I, good. I got more of like a like a baby puke, you know, sort of sulfury kind of baby vomit yeasty thing maybe but this beer is crystal clear so i you know i don't know where that came from but yeah. celery interesting well I'll, and I'll tell you what's weird well you're closer to having a, a baby than i am <laughs> i mean my, my my daughter is 16 and yours is you know much less much less old than that and i've kind of blocked out the whole baby vomit aroma mm -hmm. um but what's i'll tell you what's weird i i cracked this beer about two and a half hours ago I judged it about two and a half hours ago, kind of cold. And I thought, well, as it warms up, it's going to get worse, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do Colin dirty like that. I'm going to leave the scores the way they are. Just talk about what I was, was tasting. I actually don't get that cellar beer de garde aroma now. I'm kind of going back to that and it smells a lot cleaner. It's, it's not, I'm still not getting the level of hop aroma that I would want to get from a cold IPA. But I'm not getting that kind of unpleasant, musty character that I did before. So I don't know. Maybe that's something that blew off. Maybe it was something that I touched. Uh, you know, I had, I was telling Cooper before the show, I was making dinner. I did, I, I had some stuff on my hands. I made sure I went back and washed them thoroughly so that I wasn't getting any weirdness. I still smelled that, but I don't now. So I'm going to chalk that up to, you know, uh, just judge. Yeah, you know, something happened to my my nose. I I don't know what. But Are I'm you not saying the beer now. smells like celery, or it smells cellar like, like a cellar, cellar, like a cellar like? Okay. I say it okay. smelled cellar like to me, uh, and that cellar e was a, a joke. Uh, that, ha ha! It wasn't really maybe a joke as much as a thing that I said, uh, an oh, okay. utterance that I made. Uh, I'm beginning but, to understand this humor thing you speak of. Yeah, and it's crazy. But yeah, I'm still not, I had a note that I wasn't getting any, there's no obvious hop aroma. And I still sort of stand by that. I'm crossing out my musty comment because something like that, if it is mold, if it's truly moldy, truly musty, it's not going to get better as the beer warms up. It's going to get worse. 
uh, it, and it's, it's not a type of, of thing that blows off. If it's going to blow off, it almost always is something that blows off in the first five to 10 seconds. So I, I'm moving up. I had given this a six before. I'm moving that up to an eight uh, because I, you know, user error on that by, by me. I, and I'm trying real hard to get that must. Uh, I, I'm not getting that. Appearance, three out of three. Uh, this beer is crystal clear, like uh, JP had said. I mean, I'm holding this up to the camera. And it's like any kind of webcam or whatever. It's a mess. But you can tell from doing that that it's this is sample is crystal clear. Uh, head is low and persistent. Uh, you know, color is pale straw. It almost be almost might be too light for this style. But, you know, I'm never going to I'm rarely going to knock a point for a beer being too light unless you have one of those weird stouts that's like a ooh, we got gotcha. you. It's really clear and yellow and whatever. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, not going to do that. And the head, you know, there isn't a specific style for this. A lot of IPAs, I mean, you really want, uh, especially like a hazy IPA, the styles really want you to have a big, thick, heroic head that lasts forever. It's not, this is a 34B mixed style. I'm not going to slag you for having a, a head that's low but persistent. So three out of three. The uh, flavor. Initially, the flavor is malty and slightly musty. Again, I'm going to amend this because just like with the aroma, I'm not getting that mustiness in the flavor either now. Well, that's good, I guess, right? Yeah, that's that's definitely a plus. There's no apparent, I do stand by, I, I made a note, there's no apparent hop flavor. I'll, I'll note that the hop flavor is is there, it's very low, and it's, it's just now starting to come out, and I'd say it's probably in the citrus family, but frankly, it's hard to tell because to me, it's just sitting there at a very low level. Uh, bitterness is low. Uh, malt is actually kind of low, uh, but they balance each other out in, in mid-palate. Uh, it's well attenuated. Uh, you know, finish is kind of, the finish is longer than it was. The finish is fast and then kind of falls off a cliff was my note. I wouldn't say right now it falls off a cliff. It's still kind of on the short end of how long a finish of a beer typically lasts, but it's pleasant. It's balanced slightly toward bitter. So um, I give that a, a 12 out of 20. Mouthfeel, uh, carbonation is low, body's medium, no warming. It's neither creamy nor astringent. Uh, the, the carbonation is a little lower than you'd really want for this style. So I knocked off a point for that and gave it a four for mouthfeel. Uh, overall impression, I'm going to come up a little bit on that because, again, it's gotten better as it warms up. And Colin, congratulations, because that almost never happens to any beer where it gets better <laughs> as it sits and warms up. Uh, so thank you for sharing. You know, my initial note was I wondered if something weird happened to this, uh, this bottle. Or something, or something happened weird during fermentation, just because of the strangeness of that mustiness. Uh, and I noted the the label was a little moldy, uh, which I had thought might have something to do with, you know, maybe the bottle was stored somewhere that was maybe a little moldy. But as it warms up, I don't think that's really a factor. Uh, you know, I'm not getting the impression this is an older bottle. I mean, it doesn't taste stale. Uh, I thought at first maybe that was it. Maybe it's musty uh, and a little cellar-like because it might be old. I, I don't know. But I, I wonder if it's just uh, – it, I'll be curious later on to hear how you hop this. I wonder if maybe there was some odd product that might be – you know, some, might be might have been old or some – you know, sitting on the shelf for a while. Maybe it's some brand new. You know, there's so much on the market now for home brewers as well as professional brewers uh, for hop products. You know, it maybe yeah, maybe it's some kind of funky new, you know, cryo squared thing <laughs> that I haven't, haven't heard of that just ended up having a weird character. But I think my math is right. Overall, I gave you 33 out of 50. I think it's pleasant. It's well made. I I think there's some issues with with hop flavor. Uh, but, you know, also I'll be also wonder if that might have had something to do with making an IPA as essentially a lager or a steam beer style, you know, the yeast tends to grab onto those, those hot polyphenols. And maybe the fact that it was lager, maybe you, I don't know if you, you did the Narzus method and kind of cranked this through in a couple of weeks. It doesn't taste like it. Usually those kind of beers have a, 
have a little bit of a, a fermentation, fusel type of, of feel to them or taste to them. Uh, you know, maybe just having the beer lager for a, a few weeks, if you did that, might have caused that yeast to be in contact with the hops longer and pulled some of that character out. I, I don't know. But uh, again, overall, and 33 is, uh, that's very good. You know, I, I think that's, uh, I apologize for judging it harshly before you even knew what I had done. Good job. I appreciate you sharing. And I'm going to throw it over to uh, to Coop. All right. Very good. Well, I was struggling with this beer too. I didn't get uh, musty, but I'll talk about what I, the process here. So for, I'm doing a home uh, bathroom remodel and I had some work to do last <laughs> night. And then I had to go get my hair cut. And Colin, then of course, what's up, man? After I'm the sorry. Haircut, I, oh, I you had can't to, hear me because you're on the same pod as these. Yeah, I had to jokers. stop. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's all funny. It's all fun and games. And I had to stop and do to some research. Not be here right now. Go ahead, Cooper. Uh, at the, uh, I had a Pliny. Okay, sorry. I had a Pliny before I judged this, and I judged it second after another beer. And I, I read what I wrote this morning, and it was a little rough. And now I'm having to retaste this beer oh that's been God. sitting out all so. It's JP, like our I, first show. It's like I our first show. We've never done this before. We don't know what we're doing. What's a show? Yeah. Uh, okay. Cooper, Here, here's what me. I got. All right. Uh, it's got a light, non-fruity ferment aroma. You know, not super fruity. No obvious um, DMS or a diacetyl. It's got a bit of a sulfury edge, like a lager. Uh, low and clean hops. Yeah. It's slightly hopped only, kind of an herbal and faint citrusy resiny thing. I got something that I was like, what is this? Something reminiscent of like pencil lead. And I just wrote pencil lead, even though I didn't want to write that on a score sheet, but I did. And then I'm smelling it again. I was like, what is it? Pencil lead, no wood shaving. No, but as I smell it again, I feel like what I'm getting is that like odd as pumpkin skin, acetaldehyde. And I'm getting as it's warmed and it's not carbonated very much anymore. I'm just smelling the beer. And I feel like there's a little acetaldehyde in here. Not heavy, but just enough to give it that pumpkin skin, kind of green apple edge, but not really green apple to me. Yeah, I not to interrupt, Coop. Now that you say it, yeah, I I think I get like that little. Sometimes I can kind of gloss over that that pumpkin skin type of acetaldehyde if it's at a really low level like this. And I I think you're right. Hmm. Pumpkin skin. Yeah, pumpkin skin. Uh, the beer was very beautiful last night. Bright and clear, yellow gold color. I think that's fine for the color. It's nice and light, but yeah. they can be pretty light. Uh, fine white head that persisted well, uh, low whitish stand of fine white bubbles and persistent foam. So yeah, kind of got repetitive there. I was half asleep when I wrote this. The flavor, cleanly malty with a low uh, breadiness. The hops shine through mellow. And then there's a nice citrus and a little earthy, a little faint piney resiny thing, but it's low. Medium, uh, well, medium low, I guess you could say. It had a little bit of, um, you know, not too much bitterness, a medium low bitterness. But yeah, it's just a, it was a little bit, a little bit rough. Touch of that bitterness lingered into the aftertaste too. But uh, it wasn't like heavy bitterness. It's just something about the water with the lightness of the beer maybe that has a, a little minerally edge perhaps. But really in the mouthfeel, it wasn't too rough or biting. Kind of had a medium light body, medium carbonation. Uh, no astringency or anything really bad there. The body is fairly, fairly dry. It's nice, the, the finish, I mean. But yeah, in the end, the cold IPA, it, 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 it is more on the kind of lagery side. And you don't want the, a cold IPA to come across like an IPL, even though you're taking possibly a lager yeast or a cold yeast, fermenting it at slightly warmer temperatures than you would uh, a lager. You know, maybe lower 60s is typical. But uh it's playing like a lager. As you say, you're, you're, in, you know, you're a lager brewer, you enjoy brewing lagers and it is kind of a, you know, a, a something, if you have a lot of lager yeast around, could be a great beer to make with some of that extra uh, stuff. But if you do it too much, like you make your lagers, it's going to play a little differently, more like an IPL maybe. And then the flavor that, that um, acetaldehyde isn't really heavy either. And there's enough to cover it up or, or it keeps it, you know, it's kind of in there, but it's not like, invading too much overall i would just say if you clean up that little acid out high in the nose uh use a nice healthy pitch of yeast oxygenate well keep it going keep the temperature controlled you probably do all that stuff already but in the end i really just want more hops it's it's a nice beer but the point of a cold apa is to get that 
you know, the beer part out of the way almost just so the hops can shine, get the, you know, not too fruity, not too heavy uh, and, and, you know, enough alcohol and hops there to kind of blend together and just say, here, here's a, a nice hop aroma. And there's, uh, you know, the fruitiness is out of the way. The malt is pretty much out of the way because you're brewing like a high adjunct, you know, uh, beer that's a light, light body and not too challenging on the malt front. You know, those are the things that get in the way of, of your hops on an, on any IPA, too much malt, too much, you know, fruitiness, too much of anything. But anyway, yeah, I, you know, I started at a, a 32 last night. I think now, not just because it's warmer, but just because I kind of figure out what that was, that odd thing, a little acid aldehyde. To me, that pushes it down more like the 29, 30 point territory where it is, you know, it, it does have some minor flaws. Uh, you know, kind of misses the mark a little bit on the style, but it's kind of, it's mostly there and it's actually pretty drinkable. I wish I had another, a fresh bottle of it to taste. And, you know, as, as Brian thought, maybe we're getting some bottle variation, but the one I had last night, it tasted, it tasted pretty good. And it was, um, well, it is cold and that helps, but, um, uh, it's, this has been sitting out all night. So this doesn't do me any real favors. I probably won't drink the rest of this, but wow, I just want to be retasted i know right so yeah that's where i'm at with that one and i, I hope you brew it again because i'd like to see the, the improve like i can see the potential there like the base of it the malt bill is really good the hops you chose seem to be pretty nice and i just want a lot more of them more dry hop and more uh whirlpool hops what have you yeah but, i uh, i yeah. give it i shoot at a 32 it doesn't taste like um an ipa it tastes like a very hoppy pseudo pilsner mm -hmm. but it's like it's very bitter it's almost aspirin in the back of my throat uh mm -hmm. that baby uh, vomit oh, maybe it's like yeah i don't know man meat it's meat <laughs> that meat smell <laughs> umami um it's something like that man and uh <laughs> so maybe it was on the yeast too long i don't know but uh it's that meat yeast kind of you know ease smell one man's cellar mold is another man's pencil lead is another meat. man's meat. Yeah. What do you got? We're we're all that, over the that's place. That's weird. Yeah, and I can I can maybe get a little bit of that meat. Uh, when I think back to what I smelled before, I'm not really smelling it now. I get it all the way through, and I just poured it, and it's like in and yeah, I get that it's sort of in the a little bit of the palate, like a little bit cedar pencil wood, not pencil lead, but like a freshly sharpened right. pencil like wood shavings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Maybe yeah, it's, some it's, steaks and a pencil after this. There you go. It's not. It's not a bad beer. It's it's a great beer. I just I don't think it's a cold IPA. If you gave this to me and said this was your, you know, German Pilsner or something like that, I'd be like, oh, okay, you didn't lager it really, but you rushed it out and it's fine. It, whatever. You know, you could you would drink this all day long at a at a at a brewery. There's nothing wrong with it. I just don't think it's a cold IPA. From what I know, cold IPAs aren't that bitter, aggressively bitter. They're a little more mellow. Um, and this does have, for me, kind of a lot of bitterness hanging on in, in the end where I think it should be cleaned up a little bit, which I know is contrary to IPA. And I think Cooper's right. It needs a little more aromatics. But uh, that's where I'm at with it. It's, it. I think you did great. I mean, it's a super clear beer. Um, it's beautiful. Yeah, anyway, man. Colin, what's up with this beer? Tell me about it. Tell us about it. I can't ship IPAs. It tastes great at home. They just don't, oh. I've never been able to do IPA. So I don't know okay. what's going on. So you don't get any of these. You're, look, you're looking at us going like, what the fuck are they talking about? IPAs that taste great at home and I ship them out and just get destroyed on score sheets. I, oh, my oh. hoppy beers just do not ship well. It is the, the height of the oh. summer in California. We've had a lot of mm -hmm. uh, 100 degree weather and stuff. But yeah, I don't recall when it landed uh, on my porch what the what the weather was like or had been. Uh, leading up to that but yeah i think it's, it's been pretty warm it was like 100 degrees today but yeah so that initial poof of aroma or whatever so i've been in a, an attempt to ship my hoppy beers better putting a little pinch of uh, potassium and bisulfite for oxygen scavenging huh. and that essentially okay. means sulfur compounds so i wonder if if you open that if it was a little bit of uh sulfur in there from reacted oxygen maybe it's a thought yeah, I mean, because the, the sulfur, I got a tiny bit and then it went away. And so I kind of thought, eh, I mean, it just maybe a yeast product. I didn't think anything of it. Um, but it didn't taste oxidized or damaged at all. Like, it really didn't. It, it, it tastes, you know, 
pretty solid otherwise. It, it sounds yeah. like all the hot aroma. Mm. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why it's, how that happened. Well, it doesn't take much. How old is the oxygen? Beer? I brewed it in May. Okay. It's not too old. So, yeah. No. Not that bad. Okay. Well, well, let's go yeah, through I'm the sorry. recipe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no. I, you, I mean, it's it, is, it tastes what it tastes. I, I don't yeah. question you guys whatsoever. Um, so, as far as green bill, it was fifty nine percent or seven pounds of six row barley, and then uh, five pounds or forty two percent of jasmine rice. So just Thai Costco jasmine rice. Wait, um, what? What percent of rice? Forty one percent, forty two percent. Okay. Cool. Why did you, can I ask why you chose six row instead of two row? More uh, enzymatic power. Yeah. Since there was so much adjunct. That's that, a lot that of makes rice sense. to convert. Yeah. Yeah. To mash that. So I took the rice, ground it up pretty coarsely in a food processor. Um, so I took all the rice and one pound of the six row and did a, a, a cereal mash with that. So I started my main mash, uh, dough in. I actually Missed my last t- temperature on the main mash at 156. I was shooting for a little lower, uh, but got that going. And then while that was resting, I uh, took the the rice and a little bit of barley, uh, two quarts per pound, heated it up to about 158, let it sit for 10 minutes, and then boiled it for about 20 minutes. So I had some nice thick porridge, uh, dumped that back in the main mash, and then raised that entire thing to about 162 for 10 minutes, um, and then sparged like normal. Is there a reason why you, you, you mentioned when we got started, right before we got started, that you like to have an excuse to brew with rice. I Have you brewed IPAs before with that high a percentage of rice? I've done American lager a lot, and they always are too malty. So I've progressively gone up in more percentage of rice, so 20%, 30%. Doing like trying to brew a Miller or something like that or a Budweiser. I don't know. When I brew it, it's just too malty. So the intent is to bring that maltiness down and get flavorless nothingness yeah <laughs> now the malt that's, the malt that's that's cool and i think the the jasmine rice gives it a little interesting character too you know a little a little aromatics yeah. on that side i wonder if that that jasmine flavor because i mean it doesn't taste well, jasmine rice I mean, like pretty much all of our listeners probably know i mean it doesn't taste or smell like jasmine flowers it's just the type of rice but it does have a little more character to it than just standard old long grain white rice, uh, like the most blah American food you can possibly think of. Uh, I wonder if maybe that that jasmine rice character is what was giving all of us a little different bit of, huh, I wonder what that is kind of moments drinking this beer. It's very possible. So, okay. Uh, did Cooper Did Cooper fall off here? I don't know. Oh, well. So, pretend uh, like you still here. What uh, what was your what was your hopping like? Uh, so I did a first wort hop of Amarillo, so about a half an ounce, and then at ten minutes I did an ounce and a half of Laurel and Ella, and then I did a cool pool hop stand, whatever you call it. Circulated the wort at about one hundred eighty degrees, and I did four ounces of Ella and four ounces of Laurel. Wow, big whirlpool. Yeah, yeah that was I, it. pretty big, are, right? Those are two hops hop varieties that I'm really not that familiar with. So what, what are the, like the characteristics you were going for from the Laurel and the, the Ella? So I was trying to push floral really hard. So okay. Laurel, literally lemon and floral, and they stuck it together to make Laurel. Um, so that, <laughs> uh, Interesting. Yeah. It has a really high linalool content. Um, and then Ella is an Australian variety one of their more floral kind of lagery kind of on that spectrum. I know they had that little, their spectrum, basically the floral side of, of an Australian hop. Right. That spider diagram or whatever they call that thing. Yeah. Spider graph. Spider graph. Yes. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that, that was that's the hop. interesting. You know, I think that okay. floral is, I love floral beers and I think some of the, you know, floral IPAs can be fantastic, but I think that's a really hard aroma and flavor to push hard like you have to to do for an IPA. And I wonder if that's why, you know, for me, I wasn't getting like the hop flavor and the hop aroma I wanted from this style. Uh, and I wonder if it's just because you know, something about those, that floral character doesn't like push out and stick out as much as maybe like the citrus and the tropical fruit, which is why IPAs, I think, tend to gravitate toward the, you know, citrus, tropical fruit, uh, dank, and not always so much the the floral or the spicy. 
Right. So that was kind of why I chose the cold IPA base because there's nothing else to compete with. So that's kind of what I was trying to do. If I could push floral on an IPA using cold IPA as the base. Yeah. That was, that was the attempt anyway. Cool. Um, Excellent. Floral comes across. What was your fermentation like? What kind of yeast did you use? So I use the uh, WLP833. That's the eyeing year strain, the um, German Bach lager. Um, did a, I do big pitch. Well, actually, this one I did a little smaller, but 1.25 million cells per le- milliliter per Plato. Uh, pitched it at 50 um, and then let it rise to 55 on its own. And then toward the end, brought it up to 60. So uh, more on the traditional lager ferment side. But how, how long did you lager this for or did you lager it? Uh, not long, maybe two weeks. Something like that. Okay. I mean, it's a cold IPA. It's a it's a mixed style, not a lager, right? So, right. Where it's not like you're you're violating, you know, the brewer's code by uh, fermenting this for two weeks, right? Right. Yeah. And, uh, so OG was sixty two. Final gravity was twenty three, which was odd. But, uh, That's the, hot, the right? So, yeah, yeah. Attenuation. Final gravity is twenty three. It doesn't yeah. taste like wow. it. It does dry beer. Yeah. I guess that's, yeah. that's what that rice will do. Yeah. I don't know. But I was as well. I thought it was ruined. I was like, oh crap. And then I'm like, this uh, doesn't taste like it's that high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I made a note that it was well attenuated, I thought. Uh, and yeah. you know, Jamil talks about this on on Brew Strong uh, with some regularity that it's whether your beer is fully attenuated, it's a sens- it's a sensory thing as much as it is a statistical thing. And if the if your tongue is telling you that it's well attenuated, then that's what you're going for, no matter what the number says. Uh, and those two things mm-hmm. weirdly don't always sync up. Yeah, you know what? And I think with rice beers, because I recently did like a rice lager, basically, um, mm-hmm. and I it finished a lot higher than I thought it did. I think that rice really does a good job thinning it out. Yeah, which is a revelation, I'm sure. But I mean, is so is a cold IPA with, brewed with rice? Like for me, I would I would take the rice out because I, oh, I want, think you want some more malt in there. You don't want to take it out. So, I mean, you want to take the, it out? The, the 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 malt bill of a cold IPA is generally like that of uh, an American lager, or you know, but beefed up to like seven percent ABV. Mm-hmm. So it's like twenty percent adjunct. Typically, you could go thirty. You can go 40 if you want. That's crazy talk, but you did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think one thing I would say is you might want to ferment it a little on the warmer side. This is supposed to be an ale. You can brew it with lager yeast. You can brew it with Kolsch yeast or other yeast that will ferment. You can brew it with ale yeast, but at a cooler temperature. But uh, you, know, you want to go lower ale temperatures to keep the fruitiness down, but not completely absent or subdued. Otherwise, it's going to play like a lager. And this one, I think, de- did. Yeah, it does. It plays like a lager. It plays like a not lager, properly lager. Yeah, I, I think of this as yeah. more like an IPA steam beer, right? I mean, it's using a lager yeast. It's not fermented at like 75 degrees or something crazy, but it's not fermented like at a lager temperature. Kind of like steam beers. From It's a lager yeast. It's not fermented at ale temperatures. fermented at like, you know, San Francisco attic, te- you know, rooftop temperature, uh, which might be, you know, 60 or something at night, right? So uh, 55, it, it, it's not like you're not trying to get it way down like you're doing a German lager. And I think that's, yeah, yeah JP is onto something there about maybe that's just, I don't know, maybe, maybe that yeast didn't like, you know, being that low for that long. I don't know, although it is an eye anger, so it probably did like being that low for, for that long. Yeah, that's kind of my normal pretty close to my normal regime for that. Usually I pitch a little colder than that, but um, so again, the, my sample in my keg, top presence was nice, beautiful, delicate. Again, I agree it was more toward the lager side than the IPA side, but that's kind of what I was going for anyway. Um, okay. so, um, bummed it didn't ship well. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, but cool. it still yeah. worked out pretty good. You know, it's, it's almost like, uh, it's, you know, if you could, if you can enter this, if you could know how it's going to end up <laughs> and you can brew it and say, oh, it's not a cold IPA. It's a, I don't know, the hybrid log or a hybrid, you know, fucking German pill or whatever. I don't know. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, I think it was good. Yeah. I, I suspect that just trying to ship this across the country in August when it's a hundred degrees everywhere and it's going to be sitting on, even if you ship it by air, it's going to be on that truck going to the airport on your end 
coming from the airport on our end, it's going to be, that truck is going to be 120, 130 degrees inside. Yeah. Uh, I guess with the new UPS, uh, you know, uh, union agreement, they're supposed to make those trucks a little bit cooler for those guys. Uh, so they don't <laughs> die, know, man. They got they really die in the UPS fine. truck, but that might help us as home brewers too, because you're shipping beer. I don't know. Maybe it's not going to be so much 120 in the back of those trucks in the summertime. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all right, Colin, you got anything else for the boys? Yes, I'm good. I appreciate it, guys. Okay, cool. He, he, d- he did send us beer. It's true. Thanks, Colin. We'll let you go. Well, yep. I was okay. I was hoping we could keep that him around time. and sip some of his beers while we talk about the cold IPA. Would that be acceptable? Oh, is that what you want to do? Did, okay, we got we got a commercial beer. Well, he sent us. Uh, did you get uh, what what canned beer did you get, JP? I don't remember. I what just put it in the fridge. Yeah. I didn't even really. I look. think there was a, it was uh, JP the one got stout? the Imperial Stout. I got a, I got an IPA and an Imperial IPA. <laughs> okay. I thought you'd appreciate that, JP. Yeah, cool. Uh, everything right. else was IPAs. So. Christ. Colin, you're never you're barred from the show. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um are you going to are you going to hang out with us, Colin? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All I'm right. Good. Well, we'll take a break and I'll go get my Imperial Stout at 8:24 p.m. before I have to do a whole nother show. And we'll uh <laughs> we'll come right back and talk about Cold IPA here in Dr. Homebrew. Hang on, we'll be right back. What's up, homebrewers? Hey, let me ask you a question. You spend a lot of time making your beer taste the way you want it to, right? Some of you even send beers into Dr. Homebrew for feedback. Well, the next logical step in your creativity is to craft some labels for those beers. And there's nobody better at creative labels than Grog Tag. Their easy to use designs let you turn out some pretty amazing stuff like labels, bottle caps, coasters, even six pack carriers with minimal effort on your part. They have a range of label sizes that fit any vessel you can think of. Bottles, cans, growlers, kegs. GrogTag has you covered. Head over to grogtag.com today and check out their line of amazing, fully customizable templates and get your beer looking its best. GrogTags are water-resistant, reusable, and will have your naked bottles looking great in no time. That's grogtag.com and be sure to use code BNARMY at checkout to save 10% on your order. I'm sorry to tell you this, but we're going to have to pour you out. Back to Dr. Homebrew. All right, thanks for hanging on, everybody. We are here. We're talking about cold IPAs. Now, we're actually going to get, like, a description, an example, really, uh, verbally, about what the fuck a cold IPA is, because everybody wants to know. It's the hot new style. Um, I've had a couple of them. I hope they stay around longer than like Brute IPA did, which is a joke, uh, because they're not that bad. They take uh, they take something that's pretty good, which is a lager, and they fuck it up by making it an IPA. But it's at least it's not as bad as it could be. Uh, Brute IPA was yeah, was that that lasted about all of six months, uh, and that was kind of oh. like to your point, Colin. In a way, I think this may be kind of what you were shooting for, right? Because Brute IPA was this idea that you just, the malt just vanishes in your mouth and you're left with like a, a aroma and flavor of hops. Yeah. 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 That's definitely what I was shooting for. Yeah. So I'm opening this uh, Creature Comforts Brewing Tropicalia in the India Pale Ale from Athens, Georgia. This is cool to get. Yep. And I've got the Scofflaw Basement IPA from, um, Atlanta, Scoff Law Brewing. There you go. I got the Mexican cake from Westbrook. Imperial Stout has habanero in it, which I'm pretty excited about. All right, what's a cold IPA, boys? And we're wrapping it up here. We got 10 minutes before we Yeah, I mean, we talked show. about all the various styles of IPA, and there have been even more, you know, juicy IPA, brewed IPA, milkshake IPA, fruited IPA. There's sour IPA, double, triple, quadruple, dry hopped, everything. You know, there's just so many. Rye IPA, remember those? Um, and, Some of those were real good. Yeah, and the white IPA, red, brown, yeah. black, everything. I like, you know what? I do like uh, Rye IPA. We had one on the last show, right? Imperial yeah. Rye IPA from Ben, I think. Yeah, that one was yeah. pretty good. They were good. And, and you know what? I like a red IPA too. I'll be honest with you. The one yeah. from yeah. Rogue was was awesome. Saint Rogue well, Red I, was great. Yeah, I can see it. Set our Sierra Nevada celebration to yep. be kind of a red and, IPA. Oh yeah, and well, a, a white IPA was kind of a or kind of the ur hazy in some ways, which typically had like some sage or something. I brewed one of those like a while back, and it was hazy and fantastic. So why do we need another IPA? There's you know so many different ones, and so I, okay, well they sell. So if somebody wanted to make a new IPA, okay, 
Uh, but, you know, IPAs, we all kind of know what they're about. I mean, well, he, none of us have tasted a real IPA, like, you know, from way back when, when they were like <laughs> shipping them from, you know, to the colonies from, from Great Britain and cast and they had to hop the stuff up so it would survive the trip. Uh, so you know, we have a brewery uh, at local here that they uh, did their best to recreate that. that so they cool. took, they, uh, they took it, they hopped it to 100 IBUs with East Kent Goldings, put a little pinch of bread in it. Wow. And then let it age out a little bit. And then I have one in my fridge. I haven't tried it yet, but. Yeah. And I you know, have, have shifted even recently in the last 10, 15 years, they've changed. So, you know, just style wise here, it's, it's morphing all the time and you don't know what it was yep. like back then. But yeah, I mean, there's some records, but yeah, it's cool. when people try to recreate that stuff. It's like, this is where this came from. <laughs> you know, I, I found the web page for Wayfinder Brewing in Portland, and they claim to be the originator of cold IPA. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, wayfinder.beer slash cold dash IPA. And they yeah. described their recipe. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Colin, did you look at this? Because they have 20 to 40 percent rice or corn mashed with all uh, uh, American two row Pilsner ball. No. So the, the the recipe was just evolution of me brewing American lager. Yeah, yeah you, you just came to the same conclusion for the same reasons that these uh, Wayfinder folks did. I think Kevin uh, but I thought was that name? was really interesting. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. I did a show with him, a session show a couple of years ago. Go find it. Kevin, uh, Kevin Davey. Yeah, he, he po posts his recipe for that and, you know, kind of challenges people to brew their own and, and do something cool. different and unique with it. Do you think I a mean, corn is a good addition for a style like this? I mean, I feel like rice is sort of the future. Yeah, I think corn is going to give it a little too too much of that, you know, the, the corn the flavor, corny flavor, and yeah. the sulfury. Because yeah, because what yeah. do you want? You want a smooth sort of entry into the thing, right? Like I'm actually drinking uh, the Mexican Lager Doctor Ombre right now. Um, yeah. It's just delicious. It's perfect. Of course. Uh, hopefully, there's enough left for us to judge it next month. But um, there is like a corn <laughs> thing, and I can't imagine that being even though it's with a lager yeast. I can't imagine being like backing a IPA level of like hops. I I, I don't know. It doesn't seem yeah. like it would jive well. I think the rice is sort of that it helps with that smooth malt transition. That's yeah. That's what you want. And you want to dry out the body with the rice. And uh, you know you could you could use a little bit of corn adjunct. You could use and you know a blend. Would a blend be uh, good? You know, in, in IPAs and and double IPAs, a lot of times they're just using sugar as the adjunct, and that's it. But this goes more to the tradition of. American lager brewing where you have that separate cereal mash or you use flaked rice or, or other, you know, gelatinized uh, grains that are just going to give you gravity without a whole lot of flavor. So, yeah, that's it just lightens it up, kind of keeps the malt aspect out of the way of the hops. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I think that like corn, I tend to prefer the flavor of corn in beer, but that's when you want that flavor. And like a pre-prohibition lager. Typically, I think they're better with corn and they're firmly bitter and there's some hop character, but it's not like an IPA. Uh, and I think that, that I, I don't know, I think that Coop's right that if you tried to go, you know, 40 percent corn in this, it's going to be no matter how well you attenuate it, you're going to get that corniness. Uh, and, and it's, it's going to give you, especially in combination with Pilsner malt, it's going to give you like a sweetness to it. That's exactly the opposite of what you want. And then rather than getting out of the way of the hops, it's going to get in the way with that sort of corn flavor. Yeah. Well, and, and no, another point I wanted to make too is like where this, the styles have evolved a little bit. IPA, you know, for a while, um, IPLs were really popular and for, they've been around for a good couple of decades. They seem to, you know, still be, you know, able to be found in a you know, number of breweries I go to and they still, they take longer to make than a typical, you know, uh, cranking out an ale for a brewery. So it's kind of a commitment, but they're fermented like a regular lager, 50 to 55 degree range with lager yeast and cold aging. They're dry hopped like an IPA and they have a similar grain bill to an IPA, which is what, uh, what differs with the, you know, the cold IPA. I uh, like when you're talking about that high adjunct is the, the, one of the biggest changes for it. Let me interrupt you. Would, would you ever do rice in a, just a straight up IPA, West coast IPA? Whatever. You could lighten your body of a double or a yeah, a, a bigger no. IPA with, yeah. with rice. You yeah. could. Most, you know, most of the time you just see a sugar addition or just mash really, really low. But yeah, you could. Okay. 
Thank you. But uh, yeah. yeah, I agree. You know, so the IPLs, they, they come out tasting a little bit like a lager. They can be a little sulfury at times. And that can kind of uh, fight against the hops a bit. If you, you don't want that to shine through, you know, get that big lager character. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of a weird animal where it's like, okay, try to decide what you are. Are you, a, you know, an IPA just, you know, brewed with lager yeast at a cold temperature? It's, you know, IPAs had already kind of become lighter in color. And these, these didn't have like super challenging malt bills either. The IPL is generally pretty light but not like the adjunct laden version of that, you know? So, uh, but you want to do your refreshing and if there's too strong and, and lager like it's going to fight with those hops, you want to shine through. So we get to cold IPA wayfinder invented as far as I know, this style and, uh, you know, the a and cold IPA is for ale. It's not an IPL just brewed some different way. It's actually kind of a different animal. Most often they're going to use lager yeast. Sometimes they'll use a cool fermenting ale yeast strain, like a Kolsch, like a hybrid uh, yeast strain to, can be employed. The goal is to reduce the fruitiness and let the hops really shine through without leaving that sulfury lager-like character to, to you know, battle against your, your nice hops that you worked so hard to put in there. So, Colin, um, do you have much uh, coal IPA while you're at? Where are you? Re- what region? I don't need your address, but just your social. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Okay. Is there, is a, is a cold IPA there or I feel like it's like wit beer still for some reason. There's <laughs> <laughs> not like a specific style here. I mean, our IPAs are maltier cause we're on the East coast, but we, I mean, there's no kind of set specific thing style. Okay. All right. That's fair. Do you, when you go out, do you go out or if you, if you, uh, if you are out, do you see a lot of cold IPAs in general? Or what made no. you like what what turned you on to want to want to brew them you know because it's it was sort of it's almost like the early days of home brewing where you didn't really know what a porter was so you had to brew it to find out what the fuck it was or like a weizenbach or whatever it, was it like that with you had you ever had a cold ip before i had some so i know like uh sierra nevada had one in one of their variety packs a while ago no. um and i've brewed basically pilsners hoppy pilsners whatever you want to call them Okay. Just trying to stop kind of with playing with Ella and Laurel and those kinds of things before. And so it's like, eh, fruits of American lager as well. So just kind of tried to combine the two. Okay. Sick, dude. Uh, I've done a similar recipe with black rice as well. So like that uh, oh, Chinese wow. forbidden rice. How'd that um, come out? It wasn't as good. Again, I only used about 20% of the rice. Because um, it wasn't American rice. Fucking traitor. <laughs> whatever dude i don't know uh, what, what flavors much- yeah go ahead sorry i'm interrupting you because i don't know yeah you're good the i don't know the black rice was definitely had more flavor contribution uh, maybe more earthy i guess i don't know it's called any it's, color it's, it's, oh. did it turn your beer gray <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was dark but it was it was kind of kind of gold a little deeper gold maybe a tinge of purple just kind of purpley yeah, gold yeah that sounds cool, man. I mean, when you cook the do the cereal mash, it is just purple, just straight up purple. Um, yeah. so. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm enjoying this Tropicalia. I have to tell you, I'd, yeah. I'd like to try it from the source too, but it looks like a pretty fresh can. It looks like it was from June, and we're in August yeah. here, so it didn't ship too bad. That's nice. Yeah, the stout's pretty good, too. I'm going to crack the other. Uh, so Brian and each got two cans. I'm just going to crack both of these just for fun. You mentioned the bearded iris from Nashville, Tennessee, which is one I've never seen. Or Cooper, why are you like eight miles away from your microphone? Because I'm reaching for the beer can that's over oh, here. Okay. I got to open it and put it in my glass. Hmm. And you don't have to drink that whole uh, imperial style. It, I might uh, actually. I don't know. How's don't the know. habanero coming weird... through on that? Um, it's there. I wish it was more. Honestly, okay. Yeah, I wish there was more, but I think pepper like that. It, it's it's hard to not get that green bell pepper vegetal thing. So you want to be delicate with it, yeah. but uh, I don't know. I kind of want a little more spice to it. I wonder, you know what actually would be good is like the Szechuan peppercorn in here, the kind of mala, uh, like yeah. like tingly with this, with the habanero and the flavors in here. I think that would be a great addition just to kind of take it, you know, take it to another zone a little bit. 
What do you think? Remember that Ed's there's Cave there's Creek chili beer from like the 90s? Mm-hmm. That they put like a freaking jalapeno at the bottom oh, of yeah. every bottle. It's like everywhere in Bevma, every end and that cap. stuff. Oh, it was terrible. And that yeah, jalapeno was yeah. meant, it was covering up that horrible lager or whatever blonde ale or crap was in there. That's, that's all like, you drank that shit and it would just yeah. like rip your face off with how, how hot it was. That's what I feel like IPAs do. <laughs> it just yeah, covers yeah. up awful fucking beer. I don't know, whatever. Uh, Garth <laughs> way, way is in the chat. Down, JP. And he says, uh, this is his first time catching us live. And he says that he's built up this mental picture about what we each look like. And we're 100% <laughs> not like he imagined. And okay. I don't know if that's in a good way or like a sexy way. <laughs> I hope that I'm far more attractive than, than you had pictured in your head. I would almost be insulted if I was that. I, I want to be. I want to be uglier than he thought. Like I really want to let him down. I'm just closing my eyes, listening to your be, your then voices. He'd be like a nice guy. He'd be like, oh man, this man sounds really handsome. I'd be like, dude, that's. God, I feel good that you thought I was good looking, and now I now you yeah. know. I, I think. Yeah. Do, do we all have faces for radio? I know, and I'm incredibly <laughs> handsome, dude. Um, all right, where are we with this conversation? Are we, Cooper, you're driving, JP, it. you're in the car. You, you, sound, you sound younger. Your voice sounds younger than, than your actual age, I think. That's all the compression <laughs> that I Okay, have. Yeah. okay. Um, so I guess, yeah, let's talk a little bit hops-wise. The cold IPAs are often using just massive additions of the typical West Coast IPA-type hops. Uh, you know, typical stuff you'd find in a regular IPA, but sometimes they'll lean toward towards some Aussie or New Zealand hops. Um, but yeah, um, you know, it's they're they're basically just a hop delivery mechanism, kind of uh, getting everything else out of the way of those hops, get the esters down, keep it as an ale, not super lager like, keeping those any lager like characters subdued as well those you know the sulfurs and those things that just kind of stay in lagers because they don't warm up enough to let release them as they're fermenting uh you know those are driven off and even if you're using a lager yeast at 60 degrees it's going to kick off a lot of that sulfur before it you know it's not going to stay in that cold beer um you know sulfur is kind of a (laughs) a volatile thing where it yeah it'll it'll stay in a colder liquid or will absorb more of those kinds of volatile things and 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 keep them in there as uh, compared to a warmer liquid. So yeah, it's just a, you know get a little light alcohol sweetness. They're typically up around seven percent. Uh, they're a little bit like a you know American lager recipe on steroids with the hops of an IPA fermented at sixty degrees with whatever kind of yeast you can get to to do that and kind of kick it out. So um, you know, do go to the Wayfinder site and kind of look at their their recipe. Um, you know, the IBUs, it says 70 plus. I'm, I don't get that much. They're not typically extremely bitter, but they, they have an edge to them like an IPA a little bit. It's, uh, you know, not going to be as soft or as a, as a, a hazy IPA kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, you do want to add some, you know, they use Magnum in the boil kettle. They do, they do add some bittering hops and some isomerized hop extract. Uh, and they do a lot of Whirlpool too. So, you know, in this one is some Mosaic Centennial and then Dry Hop with Chinook, Cascade, Amarillo. Um, and they're using the Vine Stepaner yeast, the uh, 3470. Uh, but you can use any other lager yeast, they say. So, oh, sure. yeah, basically rice, you know, a lot of rice with, uh, you know, with two row barley. Six row is more traditional, like like Colin said, to, to get more enzymatic. Uh, I wonder, you know, with six row, you have the the husks are more compact, so you might get more husk character out of that too. I think two row has plenty of enzyme to convert, probably even 40 percent rice uh, with a modern, well, you know, uh, well well made malt. You know, it's it's going to have plenty of uh, enzyme to to convert that. So you shouldn't have to worry too much. You can always do a starch test if you're worried, and and let it go a little bit longer if you think it's not converted but uh yeah it should work especially if you're using flaked rice or you know or you know well ground up rice that you actually boiled or did you know got gelatinized one way or another uh that's more the traditional way but yeah with most home brewers they're probably going to use a flaked rice and and uh you know a typical two-row malt 
and uh, not too much in the way of any specialty malts. You don't want to get crazy there and start at it, making it red or something. There's no red. I haven't seen a red cold IPA yet. I've seen some of them get a little darker than I might want them to be, but uh, yeah. Red cold IPA. That sounds a little too <laughs> intense for me. Cold rye IPA. Yeah. That might be the IPA cold that rye IPA really might goes be crazy sick, for. Dude, yeah, that'd be good. Man, when are we going to get this cold IP variants of like that kind of shit? That'd be wild. To me, you know, a lot of them taste just like an IPA that you don't really get. The rice doesn't have a lot of flavor. It just lightens up the body like the sugar does. So it's kind of a a nice trick. And it's brewed at a lower temperature to keep the, you know, it is noticeably less fruity than an IPA for sure. When you taste a good one. The Wayfinder I've had several times and it's, it's quite good. And it's not very fruity, very hot forward. There is a nice little edge of bitterness to it. It's not a wimpy beer. It's, you know, 7%. And it goes down pretty easy, light body. And then you just get the nice hops in there. So, you know, that's kind of what it's about. And there's debate as to whether, is it really its own style? But, you know, they're doing something unique. And a lot of people have kind of latched onto this. And I think they're, you know... They're definitely, they made more of a splash than the, uh, you know, the Brute IPA or the Sour IPAs or other things that have popped up over the years. Uh, they might be kind of, you know, replacing some of the IPLs because, and you can crank them out faster too. So do people still make IPLs? I thought that died out quicker than Brute IPA. There's a series of, of IPLs at, at Altamont Beer Works. They make indie pale lagers all the time. And, they're they're uh, pretty good. I, I like the Altamont yeah. IPLs in general. They make one called Freedom Fuel. It comes out around the 4th of July every year. Freedom. And, yeah. It's just they're And then they just, you know, oh, it's the Fuel series. Have you seen Altamont beer that says Fuel? Oh, yeah, you talked about this last time because it's like now they just call it a cold IPA or whatever. So there's Cashmere Fuel or NASA Fuel or this or that Fuel. And they're all pretty good. They really do lager them. It just it, it must just be a passion project for Norby over there doing something fun that he likes to do and holding the fermenters longer than, you know. It, it is wild to me how brewers were able to take three little letters and turn it into like a money press with IPA. Yeah. Nothing sells as much as the putting those fucking three letters at the end of it. And it's not even just like an anti-IPA rate. It's just, it's just uh, fucking marketing or whatever. There have been That's all it is. over it too. Like, I mean, insane. Let, somebody's logo looked a little too much like the Lagunitas logo. They sent all their lawyers and whatever. Sierra Nevada. Yeah. yeah. Which you have to. And Brian will, do, don't get Char started on oh that Oh my shit. God. That, You'll be here forever. But you got to do it. That whole thing, uh, they, that law firm sold, uh, Sold a lawsuit with that complaint. Oh my God. I, I I could talk for half an hour about just that complaint <laughs> and how, why that thing went away in two weeks. That was a travesty. Yeah. But uh, uh, that, that's, that's one, one lawyer's opinion. It was like when, when uh, Greg Cook like got all up in arms about Keystone and changing their cans to, well, no one's going to take sucks, a Keystone dude. light and think that it's a stone beer. Like they, those beers have some, you know, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you, I, I won't, JP, I'm not going on too long about this. I was at the dollar yeah. store. You got about a four-hour time limit. About, about so two ahead. years ago. I saw this 12-pack of beer. It said Stone on it. And I thought, well, why is Stone making a beer I'm going to buy at the <laughs> dollar store? And I pick it up and I look at it some more. And then those tiny letters, it's key, like Stone. And I likelihood of confusion, I was confused as a consumer who was fairly educated about beer. So that that but, one makes sense. And I, I understand Stone Stone won that and that that was that was legit. Yeah, yeah, but also you weren't as you weren't confused enough to buy it, which I think is that's where the, the discrepancy happens. <laughs> no, like you were mo- smart most enough consumers, to look, right? mo- most consumers at the average consumer would at the assume dollar store without looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love hey, buying I've I love buying about- light beer at the dollar store. Oh, God. I was there with my buddy who will buy like beer at the dollar store. And I'm like, dude, come on. But that's, he, he does what he does. Or that's, that's, that's okay. Did you hear the, uh, have you heard beer? the, it was something like leaked conversations that just uh, came out. I saw it on TikTok or whatever, where there's a bunch of CEOs of brands talking about how they're raising prices because they can, because they know no yeah. one's going to bitch about it. And yeah. one of them, one of the CEOs was the Constellation brand CEO. And he's like, yeah. brand by brand, beer by beer, we'll figure it out. But we, we now know we can, we don't have to leave money on the table anymore. We will just, in, it's not, it's not a matter of should we raise the prices? It's a matter of how much can we get away with? Like, 
damn, dude. Man. Yep. That feels good to know that this beer is now, well, whatever. Anyway, um, okay, are we done with this? Uh, Coop, did we cover yeah, everything I, at Cold IPA? Were we informative? I feel like I, we just rambled. but just I'm not going to go through the, yeah, the whole, you know, the recipe. And you can vary your recipe from, from you know, this start. And there's a lot of different recipes out there now. And there's been some development to the style. So, you know, go out and explore some and, and uh, taste yeah. it next to a regular IPA and see what your taste buds tell you. Is this a unique, different style? Or is it just, is it, you know, a marketing thing? But I think it's it's got something to it. You know? Yeah, I, I normally tell people to stay away from IPAs, but I do like, I think the style is cool. I think it's a fun, a fun little take on the style. So definitely yeah. get out there and check them out. Um, one thing I would say is if you're going to use any specialty malts, just use some lighter stuff like Vienna, some light Munich, maybe some very, very like crystal, but you know, and sometimes a little wheat, something like that. But uh uh, you know, you, you could, you could experiment with, with a little bit of malt, but you're, you're probably not going to want to go crazy there. The, the, that's, you know, in a, in a regular IPA that you can get away with some of that stuff, but you're usually not going to find any, any actual crystal or caramel water. Like maybe the lightest touch of something, if you wanted to give it a, a little touch more body, but you know, uh, the, the, one of the points of it is to be dry. It's, it's just, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think it's mostly, yeah, mostly just like the, the lager, light lager recipe i was looking at the notes for for the regular ipa it's like those have gotten lighter over the years where you're just you know if you put caramel malt in an ipa these days you get yelled at but that you know i see some IP, ipas going back towards that a little bit some some have a little more you know a little more richness to them i i recently went to the midwest and i was able to have uh you know bells two-hearted <laughs> Poured in a, they like, you want the big one? Yeah. My brother and I were biking, like, you know, 20 miles or whatever. And, uh, like, yeah. So, you know, it, I got a full tankard of Bell's 200 ale and it tasted so good. And that beer has some richness to it. It's not just, you know, uh, you know, all the malt out of the way. So, you know, if you want, you know, you know your IPAs, maybe they'll drift back a little more towards some of the classic. Of what you expected in a in a West Coast, it might not go back to the the '90s IPAs or whatever, but or, or the aughts IPAs. But uh, you know, and and maybe if you want cold IPA, you know that's going to generally be lighter and cleaner and out of the way, and just just the hops. Thank you, sir. Uh, so you know, but yeah, have some fun, brew brew something, send us a cold yeah. IPA. Do I'd it. love to taste some more of them, and and uh, we'll help help guide you on it and have some fun. Yeah, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. Colin, are you leaving or are you staying? I think I'm on the next show. All right. All right. So you're staying? Yes. All right. Hell yeah, dude. All right, hang on. That's uh, you said. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hello, fellow BNers. This is Sully from the 21st Amendment Brewery located in San Francisco, just two blocks from Giants Park. Before Nico and I opened the 21A and before I was a professional brewer, I homebrewed on my small four-burner apartment stove in a back house in Santa Monica, California, making my extract brews before graduating to the daunting idea of all-grain brewing. Homebrew books and information was hard to come by back then. The internet hadn't been invented yet, along with other things we take for granted today, like electricity and potable water. One thing I wish I had back then when I was learning was a radio show that could teach me the ins and outs of brewing and answer questions that I had about homebrewing, a resource for making great craft beer. The 21st Amendment Brewery is excited to be a proud sponsor of Dr. Homebrew, a great show that teaches you what you need to know about making incredible beer. Good stuff. Listen up, you might learn something. I certainly did. And thanks for your support. Tasty Crack Games. Back to the examination. All right. Thanks for sticking tight, everybody. Appreciate it. We're just going to wrap up here real fast. And, Do you uh, want a genius idea before we wrap up? Sure. Cold, cold hazy IPA. No. Uh. Oh. No. Cold milkshake IPA. <laughs> cold imperial milkshake ipa well when you know are, are people using see I, I liked i liked the the sort of um i don't know uh, 
promise of a future that Kvyk was delivering for a little bit. For for a while there, everyone was really hopeful because there's so many different strains and blends of that frigging yeast. And I made a, a mild with a, a dark mild with a Kvyk and it was fucking awesome. And I feel like that style just sort of disappeared, but I feel like that could make a really killer like Imperial Stout. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Just like how Saison to, was, yeah. uh, there was like a year uh, around 2010 when Saison was everywhere and different kinds of Saison. And it was fucking awesome. And the great promise of different, of Saison and then it vanished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there was a while for sure. Yeah. Everyone was making them and, uh, you know, they were good and everyone kind of moves on because the customer's fickle. And I think yeah. at the end of the day, they always gravitate toward back towards IPAs. Yeah. That's just what it is. But I wonder, um, I wonder how that's going to go with IP, with cold IPA. I almost said IPL. Oh no. I almost uh, like a heretic there for a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It'd be nice to, to get back to like different yeasts and stuff like that for stuff. I don't know. And like talking about it more, like have it more part of the, the conversation. So like a lot of, a lot of craft brewers were using different yeast for stuff, but they weren't saying it. But now mm-hmm. it's part of, it's part of the marketing. Like the consumers are savvy enough now to understand that the ingredients make the beer. And so they will buy a beer based on the ingredients, like doing those single hop beers that a lot of people were doing and like Roger at Faction still does. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it sort of trained the consumer to be like, okay, this ingredient tastes cool. This ingredient tastes cool. Let's blend these together. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then they can, it's, it's a much more of an educational thing. Um, and I wonder if we're going to need to start getting that with, uh, with yeast specific stuff too here soon. Yeah. I, I'm kind of surprised in a way. I like IPAs. I'm an IPA drinker, but I'm kind of surprised that they've stuck around as long as they have because it's yeah. a delicate product. And you usually when you find the IPAs that I used to buy in the grocery store in the aughts, they had probably sat there for, you know, six months to a, you know, a year or so longer. And now if I get an IPA that's less fresh than two, three months, I'm like, oh, this is old. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, oh t- it's long in the tooth, you know, and, and that sometimes the, they don't put the brood on date. They put the best buy. You, know. you don't know how long they're allowing. You find I, something on the shelf. That is the other side of this industry that sort of baffles me where it, how much we've talked about freshness, it needs to translate into sales also. And so you're, I think you're going to scare more people away by saying this was canned on this date. But if you're being, um, if you're being clear, I guess, and transparent, that's the date that you should be putting on there. But a lot of people still put best buy and it's like, well, you have no fucking clue. The industry default six months. Yeah, they yeah. should put both, I think, if they want to put a Best Buy. But Yeah, there put, was a great brewery that I really liked to buy their beer, I, I will, which I shall not name. Uh, and about five, six years ago, they stopped, they, they took all the dates off, period. Because uh, I, I was one of those guys that would rummage through the, the, the beer store. It's like, oh, no, this is more than a, a <laughs> month old. I'm going to buy this. And I think that's why they stopped doing it because people would rummage around, you know, pick the stuff out of the back. You know, they wouldn't buy it if it was too old. And I think it kind of backfired on them because they're not, uh, they're not in the supermarket or the liquor store as much as they used to be. Back. I in the doubt day. the average. Yeah, I doubt the average person is doing that. It's oh, I'm, not, I'm sure they're not. But yeah, yeah but yeah. maybe that's why. I, I, I do that. I do that as well. But it's just because we kind of know our stuff <laughs> I do it the only thing I do it with for the most part is Sierra Nevada pale ale mm-hmm. yeah and some lagers maybe but yeah anyway I don't really do it too much because I don't really buy a whole lot of beer <laughs> that's probably also it too like I'm the asshole who gets a 12 pack of Modelo and I'm just like okay I'm not even looking because I, I don't understand uh, but it's interesting right. I don't know like for all like the stories that we've been taught and marketed to about uh, from craft breweries where it's like you know know the brewer and, and the fresh is better and drink fresh or whatever it's like they can have the most confusing day code imaginable it's like dude yep. I'm not you know I'm not in ancient Egypt trying to write some fucking hieroglyphics and just tell mm. me when it was made <laughs> just tell me and then and then you know what work with your distributor to for figure out beers, if it's fresh or not yeah it matters more than others but for yeah for IPAs it's it's crucial. You just can't, I mean, yeah, you can't age. You don't want to age them intentionally. It doesn't, doesn't help. Yeah. All right, let's get out of here. Um, oh, if, if somebody wanted to send us a cold IPA or another style of beer or a hazy IPA, they could uh, do what? I guess they could email Brian. Which of us is Brian? Uh, Brian with an I. Brian. 
or your spell, you spell yours with an I as well. Of it'll, it'll come to me, Brian with an I at the brewing network.com. Send us your beer. I wasn't going to save you from that one. I was letting you dig your own. I'm just mm. yeah, dig yourself you out of your own edit it out hole, and post. Um, no, nope. I was curious where you were in, going dog. with that. Yep. This is how you learn to just say the things. You're trying to be too clever. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me how no. I know. Brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. Send him some, uh, send him some um, you know, whatever the fuck it is. Emails, digital co- uh, communication, and uh, we'll get you on the show. Um, eventually. And if you want to be cool like Colin, send us a bunch of commercial beer too because you're nice and we'll maybe we'll let you hang out and you know, yeah. listen to us bitch about nothing and waste your time. It's been fun to like taste that. Colin. The Bearded Iris has some nice tropical and, and some stone fruit in it. It's really good. Yeah, I like this Imperial Stout, dude. I have not had an Imperial Stout in a long ass time. You knew you needed it tonight. I so did. I'm in your pissy mood. I fucking, I'm such a bad mood right now. It's improving your mood, I can tell. Like, the next yeah. show is going to be so much fun. It's just going to suck. <laughs> I, hope, I hope Colin's on the next show. That's the only thing I'm going to All right, everyone. Because Colin's on. able to deal with your mood. Yeah. We will be back if you're listening live, uh, basically Garth and Cody. Uh, <laughs> uh, big shouts out. Big fam. Um, hang on tight. We'll be, you know, we'll be back. But if you're not, then go listen to the other thing, uh, other shows. If you haven't listened to the Shrink, Shrink Schlinker Lush show. Garth says in the chat, it's one of the best shows he's ever listened to. And my friend Tommy sent me a text. He goes, dude, that was probably the best podcast I've ever heard in my entire life. It's like multiple people tell us I've, that we did. Yeah, I've had clubs. Oh, members. Did you know what made that a great episode? Me. Because Matthias was no. fucking phenomenal and we just shut the hell up and let him talk. That's why it was great. That's weird. Well, yeah. it was genuine. I wonder if that's just, a lesson we yeah. should learn. I I said, nah. Okay. All right, everyone. We're going to get out of here. Uh, Until next time, we'll see you.